All right, ladies, we are going to start in the book of Matthew with the very words of Jesus as we jump into this topic of my mouth. And in Matthew chapter 15, verses 18 and 19, it says, But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. And those are the things that defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, theft, false witness, slandering. Man, according to this passage, our words come from our heart. The things that can defile us, the things that cause us to mess up or start to nag or speak in, in crazy ways, it says they actually start inside our hearts in our thoughts. That is so interesting to me. Do you remember in week one, we learned about 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 through 6. Do you remember? We, we really dug into that piece in your homework. It promises that in Christ and under the authority of the Holy Spirit, I have power to take every thought captive. So I actually have control over what I'm thinking. So when a thought comes that's going to lead me down a wrong path, right? I can make a choice to push that out of my mind and think of godly things instead. What would godly thoughts be, though, right? What, what should we be thinking about instead? Well, the Apostle Paul actually gives us a list, right? Don't you love it when Scripture answers that question? In Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, he says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence, and if anything is praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Can I level with you, though, when I read this list? Like, I have this vision of a campfire and singing, like, kumbaya. I know they're kind of vague, churchy words to me, right? They're kind of, I don't know, feel-good words without a lot of meaning. If I'm supposed to think on those things, I better understand what the words actually mean, right? How can I apply them to my marriage if I don't know what they mean? And I tell you, honestly, I'm kind of, I don't know, a word nerd. I love biblical word studies because I believe that the Bible is this amazing how-to guide for life. If only I understood what it said. <laughs> Today, we're going to walk through each of these eight words describing the ways we should think, and we're going to see how to train our minds by asking some very direct questions about our thoughts, right? We're going to ask these questions to ourselves. And the first word that we're going to look at from this list is true. We're going to ask ourselves, is this thought true? Is it a fact? We have to evalu evaluate the thought objectively, right? No emotions allowed here. And honestly, sometimes I need a second opinion from someone who isn't directly affected by the situation, right? Because I can get all kinds of caught up in my emotions. I tend to believe myself. And this has really been proven through science, you know, that we believe what we say to ourselves. So it's crucial that we not let our minds think and linger on emotionally driven thoughts, which are often partial truths. In my marriage, I tend to think in the extreme. I don't know, are you like that? I tend to think like, he always does this, or, oh, he never does that. But always and never, they're not really true thoughts. I need to be careful to think things that are true rather than emotional. And, and girls, if we are forgiving our husbands regularly, like we talked about, right? Living in that pre-forgiveness, right? Then I'm not, I'm not keeping a running log of his offenses anymore, am I? So when my husband messes up, that offense stands alone, Right, so a true thought, instead of being, oh, when he messes up, he always does that. A true thought would be, man, what he did, that just hurt me. And this is a way that we can kind of put a stop to that tendency to let our thoughts escalate, right? Because my mind can very quickly blow up that offense and start a fight. 
right? But we have to break this pattern by thinking of what is true. All right, our next word is honorable. So we're gonna ask ourselves, is this thought honorable? Is this thought of the highest possible opinion? Is this thought worthy of respect? So when my husband hurts me, I have to remind myself, he is not the sum of his mistakes, right? Just like I don't wanna be known for my mistakes, like the woman who always turns the socks pink or the wife who can never park the band straight. Instead, I have to deliberately think of his strengths and I have to remember, and we all fall short sometimes, we need grace, right? I have to think of the ways he's grown and when I do, it reminds me, God is able to work in him, to grow him, to change him without my help, right? That stops my need to nag him because I'm trusting God. And when he repeats the same mistake, if I am, am doing my part right, then I'm going to trust God to teach him. And I'm going to choose to think highly of him anyway. Now listen, I am not suggesting that you be naive to faults that cause you harm, right? There is never a place for emotional or physical abuse. Those have to be addressed and you need to make sure that you and your family, that you are in the safest place possible. What I'm talking about here though, are the things that drive us crazy, right? The things that kind of go against my preferences, the unintentional things that can hurt, even sometimes the things that are intentional, Right, we talked about in our week of forgiveness that there will be a time, a less emotionally charged time, to go back and talk about those things and work through the hurts. What I'm talking about here in this thinking in honorable ways is taking the high road and letting God have your back because he does. Our third word is just. Is this thought just? Is this thought about the right or the righteous thing to do? Right, this is talking about those times when we've been wronged and we would naturally plan ways to retaliate or, you know, if that's not the extreme, maybe just to set the record straight, right? This one kind of feels high and lofty to me, but then I see God giving us clear instructions about that, right? It happens often that we want to set the record straight. So in Romans chapter 12, we're going to read verse 17 through 21. It says, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. And do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. So when I'm going to think a just thought, instead of setting the record straight or taking revenge, I have to take the high road. Right? When my husband has messed up or wronged me, I refuse to plan ways to get back at him. Instead, I take my hurt to God and I seek his wisdom. And then I ask God to reveal to me anything I did that could have led up to this. Now, it is not always my fault, but you know what? Sometimes it is. And God will show me and show me how to make that right. When I'm in the right, I can ask God to defend me, to work that out with my husband, right? God's word is full of references of God being my defender, my protector, a strong tower I can run to when I'm in need. And as I let him defend me, instead of trying to defend myself, two amazing things happen. The first thing is, I'm no longer in the wrong, okay? Because I would have been if I had tried to defend myself, right? If I open up my mouth to defend myself to my husband, I am going to chop his legs out. I'm going to be disrespectful and I'm going to make things worse with no real change happening. I know because I've lived that story. 
The second thing is when I pray about it and wait for God to defend me, God is able to teach my husband in ways that affect real lasting changes in him. Ladies, I have seen this as recently as this week when after a very hurtful situation, a very intense moment from my husband, I followed this piece and I shut my mouth. I took this hurt to God to defend me. I went ahead and took care of the thing that I needed to at home that I didn't really feel like was my place. And y'all, my husband came back to me within an hour to apologize for his selfishness, his word, not mine, and to ask forgiveness. This is an outcome that is now commonplace in our house, but only by God's divine intervention and because I am taking the high road here. The fourth word we're going to look at is pure. Right, we're going to ask ourselves, is this thought pure? The word pure in this text is linked to sexual purity. So do our thoughts line up with God's design for healthy sexuality? Right, which we know from the scripture is one man with one woman for life. So when our thoughts linger on anything outside of God's design, okay, that could be erotic reading. It could be pornography. It could be flirtations outside of the marriage affairs, even emotional affairs, sometimes they're face-to-face. A lot of times nowadays they're online. When our mind goes there, we are thinking impurely. Now, I spent a lot of my life devouring romance novels and watching pornography. Purity and thought is an area I wrestle with actively, right? I have had to guard my eyes and my thoughts to keep from being pulled back into that sin struggle. And I pour a lot of scripture into this brain to try to push that impurity out. And I stand on the promise of Galatians 5.16. And, and I'm putting this here because I know so many of you, that is a struggle for your husbands. And this is an area you can pray and a scripture you can pray for over him. If not yourself, this particular issue is becoming more and more common in women. So Galatians 5.16 says, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Can I be honest with you for a second? Part of this that still lingers is actually imagining what would life be without bed? Right, those romance novels, even the fairy tales that I love, they set up this unrealistic standard of my perfect man and my perfect life. And it can be so easy to just daydream about that when things are not going great at home. But it breeds this discontentment in my heart, right? These thoughts, they sabotage my marriage. I've had to stop daydreaming and just live with my feet and my brain firmly planted in reality. Our fifth word is lovely. So we're going to ask ourselves, is this thought lovely? Is there an acceptable, pleasing quality of this thought about that person? To think this way, we have to learn to see past the outside, really to dig into the heart of the person. I have to deliberately choose to set aside my negative thoughts, right? There's always going to be things negatively to think about and criticize, but I have to look more deliberately, more diligently to find the good in people. What's interesting about this is the more I seek out the good in others, the more easy it is to find it. It's sort of like an acquired taste. My my youngest little blessing was born with several food allergies, and we've had to adjust our diet to accommodate that. Um, One of the foods we've had to add in is avocado. Um, And at first, the taste of an avocado is gross, right? It is green. It looks slimy. It's mushy. This is not a yummy snack. But we needed what was in it to supplement what's missing. Um, So after a while, you know, you kind of begin to tolerate it. You know, I have to eat this and it's fine. So we are six years into this and I can tell you now that avocado is one of our favorite snacks. Thinking lovely thoughts 
is something we have to acquire a taste for, right? We have to keep at it until it becomes natural and it will become natural just like now eating an avocado is natural for us let me give you an example but to get the example you have to understand that bud he didn't grow up in the church right i've shared part of that story that his salvation happened in his mid-20s and there was no overnight metamorphosis right from party man to a good little church boy it did not happen that way we fought about so much in that early period of time, but the thing that stands out even to this day is our fights every Sunday morning. Every Sunday morning. It is not the way to get ready to go into God's house. I applied this thinking lovely thought bit there first, um, but it was challenging, right? I had to let go of my preferences as I sought to feed my desires. You see, I preferred to be a couple that was presentable at church, right? I wanted us to fit in easily. I guess that's kind of shallow, but, but it is what I was pursuing at the time. What I desired, however, was for my husband to be growing spiritually, to one day lead our family spiritually, to go to church, to make godly male friendships that would shape his life and his walk. So instead of quickly noticing that Bud is wearing beat up old ratty tennis shoes to church, I choose to look deeper, to be grateful that after working such a crazy shift, he got up and got ready at all. I choose to look at the inside and see that his heart wants to be in God's house this morning, even though his mind wasn't really thinking of my preferred wardrobe choice. Now, today, we don't fight about his wardrobe on Sunday morning. It hasn't changed, <laughs> right? He still has not kind of turned turn to my preferences. He sees no point in that, but he does get up and go to church without prodding. He does make sure that our girls are at church. He is reading the word of God on his own. He is making good, godly male friendships and growing more and more. All of that, I was in jeopardy because I was nagging him about how he dressed. These lovely thoughts that I have adopted into my way of thinking, they really saved us so much here. Our sixth word is good repute, and, and it's a word we don't really use in our time, so we need to dig into it a little bit, right? Instead of thinking is this thought of good repute, let's think, is this thought kind? Is it of a good report, like a true friend, or is this thought gossip? To test this one out, I kind of asked myself this question of my thoughts, thinking as though my husband is my best friend. If this thought left my mouth and then was reported back to him, would it wound that friendship? If it would wound him, it's not of good repute, right? I have to take hold of that thought and push it out because, y'all, it will eventually come out of my mind of my mouth, I mean, if I keep thinking about it, I've got to take care of that while it's still a thought. Our seventh word is excellence. Is this thought excellent? Is this thought morally good? Now, a moral is a standard that's held by the majority of the people around us in our culture. Honestly, though, the society that we live in has very little to no moral compass. So, and even within our church, it's severely depleted. So I'm going to suggest that we gauge morality from the scripture alone, right? To think this way really requires us to be women of the word, women who are reading the Bible, who are thinking of it often, who are working hard to memorize portions of it. But when we are regularly in the word and a thought comes into our mind that's not excellent, there's going to be warning bells that go off all around, right? This is the way the Holy Spirit can protect us from harmful thoughts. Our eighth word is praiseworthy. Is this thought praiseworthy? Does this thought honor God even more? Does this thought lead me toward worship? I think this last test is the most challenging, right? How many of our thoughts lead to worshiping God? Many of my thoughts in the day are just kind of task driven. Like I need to wash the clothes, the dishes are piling up, those kind of thoughts. 
how, how do those worship God? But then I see in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it tells me I'm to present my body as a living sacrifice to God. It's talking about how every part of my day is supposed to be an act of worship to God. So I can, but, but how do I do that? How do I direct my task-driven thoughts toward worship? A friend some time ago taught me that I need to infuse an element of thanks, thankfulness into my routine. So, so it would look like as I'm running through my list of housework, you know, all the things I have to do, wash the dishes, fold the laundry, um, sweep the floor, right? I can be thankful that I have a house to clean. As I'm thinking about what I need to wear to this meeting tomorrow, I can be thankful I have clothes or a job or a ministry to plan for. Right, this kind of thinking, it can be transformed and be worshipful, but it really is going to require some intentionality on my part to change that pattern. Because if I'm honest, I would say for certain that most of my thoughts actually lead away from praising God. Let me give you an example, right? If in my mind, I'm complaining about these tasks, right? That is the opposite of that thankful heart God instructs me to cultivate. Do you know if my thought is, oh, these kids never get their clothes in the laundry basket. I know they didn't wear half of these clothes. Why am I washing them? Or, you know, he has used six cups, six cups. Why am I washing six cups? Right, that's not a thankful, not a thankful thought. Or if I'm angry, right, and I'm listing my husband's every fault while I'm doing something, right, that is the opposite of the forgiveness and kindness God instructs me to show. It will eventually come out of my mouth. I know if I leave it unchecked in my thoughts. So I've got to fix that, right? But here's the deal, right? These complaining, fault-telling kind of thoughts, they're naturally in line with our human sinful nature. They're normal, right? Everyone does this. But, right, but we are being challenged in this study and in this passage specifically to do it different. And we have to remember 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, that says the weapons of our warfare right? They can be used to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We don't have to think in those human ways. We can capture those unpraiseworthy thoughts before they lead us astray. We can replace them with thankful or praiseworthy thoughts. Now this passage here, it ends with an instruction to dwell on these things, which means to calculate, to weigh, to meditate on the good thoughts. And I heard Pastor James McDonald teach on this so many years ago, um, and he shared an analogy about that that has stuck with me to this day, and I want to share with you. He compared dwelling on the good thoughts to chewing cud, kind of like a camel that eats and then regurgitates it so they can chew the food over and over and over again. Right? That's what this passage is telling us that our mind should do with good thoughts. We should be continually turning over those good thoughts in our mind. So there's no room left in our mind or time left in our day to dwell on the negative things that are destroying our chance for victory. Philippians 4.8 is one of those verses that, that it would be great to memorize, but I'm going to challenge you to take time today to think through each of these eight positive ways to think. I want you to write out an intentional thought about your husband for each of these eight. You're going to use that thought to replace the thoughts that you are going to take captive and push out of your mind now. And if you get stuck, right, you can't think of a lovely thought or, you know, a pure thought, search for a scripture about that word instead. The reality is if we don't replace those thoughts, right, it's not enough to take them captive. If we don't replace them with good thoughts or even scripture, right, it's going to leave this void in our mind that probably is going to be filled in with another negative critical thought. But here's the thing. There is a reward for changing our thought pattern this way. Paul tells us in verse 9, the things you have heard and learned and received and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace 
will be with you. Peace. Man, that is a word that just sinks into my heart, right? As we are seeking to find hope and joy, peace is where God meets us. When we are taking that first step toward us, ladies, he tells us that if we seek him with our heart, our whole heart. He'll be found by us. And as you are intentionally, deliberately digging into the word this week, thinking about your words, God is right there to give you his peace. Let's pray. Father God, we just praise you for being our defender and protector and provider, for being our peace when things don't always seem fair or right, when it feels like we are the only ones working on this side, when it feels like it's always us and we need it to be more. We need you, God, to give us your peace that is beyond understanding. We need you to remind us that you have him. You are working on him as we are intentionally working on ourselves. God, that when we take that step toward you, you are there, God. Thank you for that. I just pray a blessing over these women as they go into this week, beginning to change the pattern of their thoughts, God, that you would equip them and give them a persevering heart that is just going to keep after it until it becomes the new habit, the new way, the new wife with her new thoughts that are going to lead to these new words that breathe life in her home. God, we give you all the praise and the honor and the glory for it. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You all have a blessed week. Dig into the homework. Take time to do the prayer piece. If you need anything at all, shoot me an email, and I will talk to you later.